Well, thanks for coming in, viewers. Let's do the next one in our Malignant Covert Theological Abuse Talks. Let me start by saying that the definition, the easiest definition of the Mosaic Law is anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And you can extend that by saying anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad outside, outside of or alongside of the finished work of Christ. That's probably the simplest definition of the law that you can get. And malignant covert theological abuse is these religious people and organizations that convince you that there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad outside of or alongside of because they love to mix it up the finished work of Christ <clears throat> now with in James and with this picking out scriptures and applying this principle to these scriptures now it says, this is James. Now, what amazes me about the book of James, viewers, and this is where you've got to be careful. This is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he still didn't quite get what Jesus was trying to teach. Now you say, oh, this is the infallible word of God. Well, <laughs> in what way? There's plenty of things in the Bible that contradict the good news of the gospel. And part of that is the adherences and demands of the Mosaic Law. Now, what you've got to realize, viewers, is the Mosaic Law was never given to the Gentiles. It's none of the Western world's business. It was given to the Jews. And 2,000 years ago, that was abolished in their Messiah. If, if you believe what the New Testament says. Now, you don't have to believe what the New Testament says. That's up to you. James 1, 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Okay, so you've got a request to lay aside filthiness and overflow of wickedness which you would expect people to do whether they're religious or not, but they're not going to because a lot of sin, um, sinful people like all this toxicity. I don't know if you've ever gone out with somebody that's come out of toxicity and has family members that are still in it and possibly they're still in it. And the next thing you know, you can't reach their levels of toxicity. So you become boring. This happens in religious religion circles too. If you can't reach the toxicity levels of their theological abuse then you start putting a bad taste in the mouth of these organizations and what happens you know what happens you're going to get shunned you're going to get pushed to the back you're going to get judged you're going to get this you're going to get that that's how these organizations work it's no different to malignant um personality disorders <sighs> really you could put malignant pathological covert theological abuse because it's pathological these people are never going to change they present wonderfully they act beautifully but underneath they're abusive because their beliefs don't help you can lay aside all your filthiness and overflow of wickedness, which would be recommended to anybody, religious or not. And you might receive the implanted word with a hostile um, attitude. If you do receive it with a hostile attitude, I guarantee you, if you persist, the word will change you. One way or another, the good news of the gospel of Christ will change you. And that might lead you to Christ. 
okay, and believing in him. That's the only way it's going to save your soul. Doing these things will not save your soul. They'll just give you a better quality of life. The only way you can save your soul is to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again three days later, ascended into heaven and sent down the gift of the Holy Spirit for you. And then you get on with your life. A lot of these people, these um, uh, malignant, pathological, theological uh, communities and organizations, not all of them, but the mass of, mass of them, um, expect you to do something on top of or alongside of the finished work of Christ. And, and that's an offense to God. So anybody would advise you to lay aside filthiness and, and your overflow of wickedness. But that's not going to save you. And receiving with meekness the implanted word is not going to save you. That's just a reception of knowledge. What is going to save you is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the danger of this is given to us in Romans chapter 7, if you choose to believe what the Apostle Paul says. And he says that when we think we're doing things to make God happy or stop him from being sad, we arouse our sinful nature. And that's what these people, these people live in their sinful nature because they've got all these malignant, pathological, theological beliefs. They actually abuse themselves with their beliefs. And if somebody's abusing themselves with their beliefs, they're going to abuse the people around them by believing that they need to believe in what they believe. But the only thing that can save you is your belief in Christ. All this other stuff is lifestyle orientated. It's not salvation orientated. How do you want to present yourself in life? How much do you want to know about what the New Testament says? And given all that, do you want to believe in Christ? That's the only way you can save your soul. Anything else is going to lead to sin. Because anything we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, which is what these people want you to do, things that will make God happy and stop him from being sad and make them happy and stop them from being sad, which is all theological abuse will arouse your sinful nature the writer goes on well I'm about to run out of time but here we have Matthew 7 and 24 be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself that's a lifestyle choice right? it's not a salvation scripture it's a lifestyle choice for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man observing his face in a mirror. That's a narcissistic style of, of, of saying, isn't it? Because um, a narcissist will hopefully see the reflection, re reflection of themselves in your life by measure of what they believe you should be living. But if you shatter that mirror by not shaping up to what they want you to live by, then these fools will tell you you're not going to save your, <laughs> you're not saving your soul. Well, the fact of the matter is, um, you can't save your soul. Jesus does that. So this is a lifestyle passage. It's not a salvation passage. For he or those observe themselves and go away and immediately forget what kind of man he was. So that's, in a way, it's asking you to reflect on your past and how bad it was and all the rest of it and now what this lifestyle is doing for you if you apply it. But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty, now this is the part that we're going to go on with in the next um, session because I'm out of time. What is the perfect law of liberty? Well, just a quick hint. It's got everything to do with loving your neighbor as yourself. And it's got everything to do with separating yourself from these ideas that there's something you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad outside of or alongside of 
the finished work of Christ.